Whereas for me, when I didn't get booked for being a straight white man, I was just pilloried and called scum <laughs> by, by like the entire comedy world. But um, oh my but, days! Is this going to just continue? Is is this it? Is this now the new? way of living is this the new normal reporting comes a yusuf he made that speech saying everyone everyone's too white white he yeah, lists yeah. all these top jobs and goes white and everyone's seen it so that to me is it's pretty hateful but he said anyone complaining about that is far right he said that in an interview so that's quite convenient isn't it you come up with racial hatred and anyone who complains is far right <laughs> and you know what it sounds to a zero seats guy like you may sound a bit flimsy but when you think about things like and i would tend to agree with you but then when you think about things like euthanasia, right? Yeah, these are key issues where yeah. we've seen in Canada, they're just offing oh, yeah. people. 13,500 killed in 2022. That's over 4% of the deaths that year. I was just doing the circuit for ages. Didn't really see where it could go. Everyone telling you, you know, there's no opportunities for your kind anymore. Then I um, did wait, that wait, thing wait, 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 whoa, whoa. So, there's no opportunities for your kind anymore. Is that what people say? Hello, friends, and welcome to episode six of the State of It podcast with your host, Lewis Brackpool. I'm delighted to welcome onto this episode Nick Dixon. Nick was a stand up comedian, now a presenter on GB News for a program called Headliners. He is also the host of the Weekly Skeptic and the Current Thing podcast. In this episode, Nick and I delve into stand up comedy in a time where the entertainment industry is obsessed with identity politics and why he left the comedy scene partly because of this. We also talked about the current state of our political system, Reform UK, Labour, the two party system, zero seats to the Tory party. And I asked whether Nick is concerned about Ofcom, the online safety bill, and how it could be used to take GB News down. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. And this episode is available to watch on YouTube, Rumble, and to listen to on Spotify. Nick Dixon, thank you so much for joining me. How are you, good sir? I'm well, how are you? Thanks for having me. Good. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'm doing all right, thanks. I think I was just saying off, off, um, off camera, you know, this is the first time we're actually interacting and it's not on Twitter. So it's actually nice to finally connect and have a chat. But um, yeah, yeah how, how are things? And um, well, yeah, that is the modern world. You can talk on X, formerly Twitter, as we now have to call it, for ages. Or you can, I've even had people on my podcast loads of times, like Reverend Dr. Jamie Franklin, and we've never actually met in person. I didn't realize until he pointed it out. You can think you know someone so well, you've never physically seen them. <laughs> you know what I mean? They might be an AI. Yeah. You'd be gutted, wouldn't you? Yeah, that would be gutting. Um, I think we've met once and that was at a together conference briefly and then that was it um but yeah no it's really good to connect man it's really really good to connect um i see you've been doing some fantastic work um over at gb um presenting um as well for headlines um i think i'm headliners, trying to very headliners very close headliners yeah that's it sorry that's a great start isn't it get the whole name wrong <laughs> um i actually came up with a name you've given me a chance to say my little factoid I came up with the name because it's comedians doing headlines. I was like, headliners, bang. And they said, oh, we look, can we use the name, Nick? We, we don't want to use your show format, but can we keep the name? Didn't pay me anything for that. I got no <laughs> bonus for that. Never been really thanked, in fact. Still waiting for a, a thank you. Well, hopefully you'll get it at some point <laughs> after this. Um, I'm trying to think as well, because you've done some work as well with Lotus Eaters. I know you know the guys over up, up, up there in Swindon. Um, and I've seen your segments on there. Uh, yeah, keep it up, man. It's it's really great entertainment. And I'm always following your Twitter and seeing what you're posting because it's, uh, yeah, it's a good laugh. And we need a laugh because, you know, the last four years have been, well, shit, really, to put it bluntly. And, um, yeah, it's great to see some humor in there. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, I'm sort of in that comedy commentary uh crossover space and it's you know if someone says you're not funny it's less like i'm fine i'm a, I'm a commentator or if someone's like oh you said something terrible i'm like i'm a comedian what are you talking about so i've just got the get out clause either way because i don't, I don't really identify to use their their word as a as a, <laughs> I knew that as a comedian 
I just don't identify as a comedian anymore because I stopped doing stand-up, which I did for 11 years. And so now I'm a serious commentator with serious opinions. And, you know, that's how I identify now. But people sometimes catch me out because it still says Nick Dixon comic as my ex-formerly Twitter handle. And they go, oh, you think you should call yourself a comedian? It's like, actually, I don't. I'm a serious commentator. Thanks for noticing. But it's a terrible insult as well. One, because I was a professional comedian for 11 years. So I don't take any sort of... Like, oh, you call yourself a comedian? Well, no, I don't anymore. And when I did, it was merely my job. So this isn't phasing me at all. Plus, I was funny since I was 10 years old. This is just a fact. <laughs> so it doesn't bother me at all. You know, if yeah. you say I'm not funny, it's just factually incorrect. So I don't care. But also, I'm not even trying to be funny anymore. So it's great. So really, I'm not bothered about that at all. People always think that's a real dig. It's only when they go at my appearance, that's the ones that bother me. Yeah. And they, those are the ones that hurt. But <laughs> other than that, not bothered. I was going to ask, um, I... I I think people probably already know the story, but I'm I'm just curious. Why is it you quit for eleven years? What was what was the reasons behind that? Oh yeah, what were the reasons? Um, well, it was kind of a gradual thing. I mean, maybe I shouldn't officially say I've quit because, of course, then people say, "Well, why are you build as a comedian on all these shows?" But <laughs> but I still, I mean, I still do. I did I did the occasional gig. I did one when uh, Jordan Peterson came on after me at Comedy Unleashed. I did do that one not that long ago, and I just did a set, and then he came on. And um, Dominic Frisbee introduced him and said, oh, we've got a young man here who wants to try a set. And Peterson comes on and goes, well, I wouldn't exactly call this a set. And then he just does a, a children's poem. It's like the cat in the bloody hat. And I was like, mate, you've just followed Nick Dixon, one of the best in the game, still got it. And you, you're doing a, a poem. I mean, come on. And he struggled a bit to follow me. Um, but <laughs> to answer the question, it's, it was a sort of gradual thing where... The comedy world was not very forgiving for the older straight white men. Right. And uh, you were told, you know, you can't have an agent and, and things like that. And I did leave my agent at one point, which is perhaps hubris, but I was just doing the circuit for ages. Didn't really see where it could go. Everyone telling you, you know, there's no opportunities for your kind anymore. Then I, um, did wait, that wait, thing wait, wait, some... wait, whoa, whoa. So there's no opportunities for your kind anymore. Is that what people are saying? Well, I'm phrasing it in a, in, a, in a funny way, but they, it was known that if you were a straight white man, you, you wouldn't really get anywhere anymore, except wow. if you were like the elite of the elite. So this was the thing I got in trouble for eventually. Someone didn't book me for a gig because I'm a straight white man. They put that in writing. So I, I shared it, all identifying information taken out. thought it'd be just an interesting wow. point to share it and just put a little joke up there. And it got just like 40 likes or something. But then suddenly the Express picked it up. And then, and then Chortle picked it up, who are this kind of uh, comedy blog that likes to attack comedians, unless they're the exact, you know, perfectly right on mm. lefty comedian. So then they got it. And then all the dregs of the comedy world attacked me, all these open micers, but also quite big comedians like Jason Manford and Richard Herring and so on. And everyone was calling me a racist and a bigot and a shit comic. And um, <laughs> it got in the Telegraph and the Express. It was on Jeremy Vine's show. Jeff wow. Norcott was defending me. I've still never watched it. I don't really look at this stuff about myself, but... <laughs> It was a bit, and that was because, it was so funny because in in any normal world, I was the victim. I was not getting booked because of my <laughs> race and sex and, uh, you know, and, and all that. But it, but actually, I was somehow the villain for not getting booked and just saying, oh, yeah, and the Express asked me a couple of things. And I foolishly answered and said, yeah, yeah, you don't really get booked. For, you know, if you're a straight right man, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was saying it should have been booked on merit. Then everyone just comes in, you're just too shit. What? It's, yeah. I mean, yeah. like, that's... Surely that's common sense. I mean, it's all about merit. Of course it is. And that that's actually wild. I, I, I didn't know that, man. Like, that's that's insane. I mean, this this is the thing. I wanted to talk to you about uh, comedy um, in basically the 21st century and how free speech has kind of decimated it. And this, this enigma of um, hyper sort of fixation on race and that example that you've given and your almost testimony to leaving comedy that kind of segues into this this nicely i mean i don't get it i don't i don't get it i thought as a comedian you go on stage you make people laugh you tell jokes because you're a comedian and that's kind of your job that's it nobody sort of read between the lines i mean there are edgier jokes and then there are light-hearted jokes there's everything but everything is fixated on identity politics and I'm guessing you were seeing that quite early on during your career and obviously explains why you left because of this current, this situation that happened. Do you see that escalating? Yeah, actually, yeah. To finish answering the, the other thing, why I left is a bit more gradual. I mean, that didn't help, but it was 
the more strict answer is it was gradual. And, and during the um, lockdown, I, it was the first time I'd not been doing three to five to seven gigs a week. Right. Sometimes I could do three gigs, five, seven, 10, right. you know, 11, whatever, just relentless doing that for a decade. Then I realized, um, then it was taken away from me, of course, because everything was taken away from everyone in the lockdown pretty much, unless you were somehow got around it by being a key worker or a member of the elite or the civil service. And, um, so suddenly it was taken away. So then I was forced to not do it. And I realized I was happier. Right. <laughs> and then, then it, I started writing for Spiked and I kind of just started speaking my mind. I realized I didn't really need to do it anymore. And weirdly, I haven't missed it. Most stand-ups are kind of addicts to it. They really need it and they, they're obsessed with it. I don't, I don't particularly need it. I'm doing headliners. I do loads of podcasts. I write. I don't particularly need that. You do, maybe you miss the buzz a little bit, but, but I gradually kind of realized I didn't need to do it. But um, that's on that point. So it wasn't strictly that, you know, Oh, I'm straight right man, so I'll just leave. And you know, but it was, but it was, but it was, but it was part of it because, yeah, it, it was building since I started comedy in 2011. I did this uh, competition. Maybe I've spoken about this before, but it was, it's called "So You Think You're Funny," and people, some famous comedians you've heard of used to win it. Every, you know, Peter Kay or Lee Mack or whoever. These people would win it throughout the years, and then they would go on to do really well. And actually, it had been men winning it just for like years and years and years, just endless men. And in the in the world before woke, that wasn't that no one noticed, no one cared. No. That was just normal because most people doing comedy are men. Yeah, most c- c- people doing comedy in England are straight white men by by its nature. So, um, so they just would win it. But then the year I did it, it was the first year of like, oh, it has to be women. So the whole <laughs> judging panel was were women for a start. All the panel were women. They had a woman in the competition who was really already too advanced and shouldn't strictly have been in it. And you thought you immediately were like, oh yeah, she's going to win, isn't she? And she did win. <laughs> and um, I got called misogynist in the review. <laughs> so oh. it was the year of women. And it was like, just for one joke that I had, you know, it was like a an ironic joke, ironic misogyny, guys. Um, but they didn't see it that way. So it was the year of like, oh, we've already started to have, you know, quotas and, and, and diversity. And ever since then, it was like, we need a woman on the bill. Any women on the bill tonight? It was always like women, women, women. And um, what's quite funny about that is there was a female comedian who later she was, they were told, there was, someone sent her an email that there were too many women on the bill or they already had one or something. They like cancelled or something like that. So she was outraged, perhaps fairly. And that sort of led to her getting the biggest agent in the country and sort of building a career off the back of it, which I think didn't work out later. But for, that was her like big opportunity. Whereas for me, when I didn't get booked for being a straight white man, I was just pilloried and called scum <laughs> by, by like the entire comedy world. But, um, oh my but, days. but yeah, that sort of diversity stuff was certainly starting. It's, it's in terms of, you know, female representation in, in 2011, certainly. And then, you know, then you've got all the works so of, you've got the racial aspect. And so you end up with a position where, you know, it was not about the best anymore. It was about, there was six spots on the Apollo, which everyone wanted to do. It used to be a massive show. Then they yeah. destroyed it and everyone stopped watching live at the Apollo. It'd be like six spots. there would be like two, white men maybe and then the rest would be like you know lesbians and people of color and whatever it is whatever the thing i'm not trying to be cynical but i'm just literally trying to describe what they would be um so the bottom there is of course you've got nearly all straight white men doing it competing for like a couple of spots and you've got hardly any of the other type of people doing it because there's not that many of them like a you know fem- black lesbian female it's obviously, obviously really less of them then they were just competing for the same amount of spots so it was very tough and obviously still some guys did well, you know, James A. Caster and all kinds of people you can cite. So there is also that as well, where people say, no, you're just shit, Nick. So someone like Sean Walsh, who's a, is a great guy, he would still do well. He would do well anywhere because he's an incredible performer. And I also look at him and go, I can't do what he does. You know, that's another level. So maybe there, there's also that aspect. So, you know, I'm trying to be very fair about it. Um, he also got cancelled because he kiss the hot dancer on the show where everyone kisses the hot dancer. Um, and they got canceled for two years off that, but then he sort of came back cause he's so good. And cause it was totally unfair anyway, bit of a long answer, but hopefully no. gives you something to work with. No, it's good. No, really good. No one ever asked me questions. I'm just like <laughs> rambling. I'm like, someone is interested in me for once. Um, <laughs> no, it's uh, like, like we were saying earlier, it's, uh, you know, it makes a change, you know, it's different cause you obviously run your own podcast as well so yeah, uh, yeah. the current thing the check current it out thing. lots of great guests and the weekly skeptic with toby young sorry to get the plug in there no absolutely no i'll be i i record a separate intro as well at the beginning oh. so uh, i'll be plugging away so don't you worry okay but let's we can obviously do it again doesn't matter but um <laughs> <laughs> i so recently 
Scotland's passed the hate crime bill and it was one of the biggest news stories fairly recently in the last week or so. Everyone was talking about it and the fact in the first as soon as it <laughs> as soon as it was put in motion the funniest thing about that was everyone reported Hamza Yusuf for his his speech which was very very funny um considering you know he was the man that drew it up and tried to really push it through but um i wanted to ask you some people were very worried about this particular bill uh targeting uh, whether it be actors whether it be comedians whether it be you know anyone really that's in kind of the media sphere uh, do you see it as a problem in your own personal view and do you see this uh, almost expanding in the future do you think that there is enough pushback um what's your take yes yeah, definitely uh, well, it's definitely a massive problem i yeah. mean how far it will affect performers in edinburgh for example I mean, I hate the Edinburgh Festival anyway because my personal experiences, but many people love it. My friend Simon Evans loves it. And you can imagine comics going up there thinking, will I be arrested for this? It's one of those things where technically they probably could be, whether they would do it because the publicity would be so bad or would it fit the loopholes like J.K. Rowling? She's yeah. not actually going to go to prison, though that's a fear. Whether they would actually do it, I don't know. I mean, as you say, they received like thousands of complaints. We, I did an article on it yesterday on, on GB. I think they had like something like 3,400 on one day. It started off on April 1st. Basically, everyone just flooded it with complaints. And then they reduced to a more sort of manageable level. But why do they even have this bill anyway? I described it last night as the very apotheosis of a narco tyranny. I impressed even Andrew Doyle with, with that phrase. Because if you go back to 1992, this guy, Samuel Francis, considered a controversial guy, but he wrote this, um, this essay, A Narco Tyranny. And it's become far more relevant now. He was looking at things like speeding tickets and stuff and, all, and gun control and things. But if you look at it now, we live in this state of anarcho-tyranny, which is you punish innocent citizens. And meanwhile, you allow actual hardened criminals to go free. It's the two together. And I just thought this hate crime bill is another perfect example because in dealing with all these complaints, in a very literal way, they don't have time. And they've said this to police, we won't have time to deal with proper complaints. So it's just another example of that. You know, more sort of egregious examples might be, you know, it's getting let off and or no prison time or a community service or something. Meanwhile, you know, a guy goes to prison for two years for stickers. And even, yeah. you know, that guy, and even if you say, okay, these guys are far right or something, well, still is distributing stickers as bad as raping someone. So this is what we have. We, we I'm sure you've talked about it before, but we have a narco tyranny now. And I just thought that Scottish hate crime bill or law was just another example of it. You just go, what are they doing? What's the point of this? Is it because they can't actually fix anything? Is it just simply to tyrannize people? Is it part of their ideology just to go on about this trans stuff? And why are they doing it? In lieu of actual actual change, anything positive, they just come up with new endless laws. How is this going to help anyone in Scotland? Who does this help? Yeah. And then on the other point, yeah, people reporting comes a Yusuf, he made that speech saying everyone everyone's too white. White. He yeah, lists yeah. all these top jobs and goes white and everyone's seen it. So that to me is it's pretty hateful. But he said anyone complaining about that is far right. He said that in an interview. So that's quite convenient, isn't it? You come up with racial hatred and anyone who complains is far right. <laughs> we seem to see this pattern a lot. The the terms well, whether it be far right, white supremacist, whether it be racist, transphobic whatever phobic and ism, it seems to be used as a weapon these days. And I, I, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but I'm guessing that you might have seen this as well in what you you did as a, as a comedian or um, of what you're doing now. I, do you know, I'm quite concerned. I'm not worried. I'm more sort of concerned. I can see a pattern happening and it, it has been happening for a while of this idea of utilizing it's it's almost like people can see a group of people can see a particular phrase or word can be used to completely shut down debate argument just rational thinking or even just jokes things that don't actually mean anything like what obviously what a comedian does as a job right so when i'm seeing this behavior when i'm seeing this pattern i think to myself is this going to just continue? Is is this it? Is this now the new way of living? Is this the new normal? Um, and I don't know, man. I'm I'm starting to get a little bit concerned because I don't see any 
I don't see, I see pushback from certain individuals, yourself, Andrew Doyle speaks about it a lot with non-crime hate instances and, you know, shedding light on that. He wrote a fantastic book. Uh, I think I've got it actually, it's free speech. Um, I'm trying to look for it, scan it from my eyes, but I can't see it from here. Uh, so forgive me, Andrew, for that, for not saying it cor uh, correctly. But the problem is, I hate to say it, but it seems to me that it's it's just political on one side. And I, I know that's it's almost obvious to sort of point that out. But what do you think? When do you think we'll get to the point where people actually start to go, this is wrong. We need we need actually sufficient change with this regarding free speech and allowing everyone to just, you know, say what they like within reason, of course. Yeah. A few things spring to mind. One is that whenever you see surveys, or we do articles about this on GB News, it's always 71% of people or something feel they can't speak their mind. This is sort of well known. This has been so, I think it, part of it was in the recent Khan review, review uh, from Sarah Khan. And she reviewed things like the Batley Grammar School incident, but she also just reviewed general feelings of self censorship. And that's the big one, isn't it? Self censorship is now absolutely massive. If you're in a normal job, you can't say anything. And even in my job, I have to be careful because there's all sorts of people gunning for me who can, to be honest, I could, get, I could go any time. I mean, it's obvious, you know, you've got so many people gunning for you when you're on GB News. But even people in, in, in average jobs, I was at some event at the House of Lords, which is not a name drop, but it just brings to mind because there were people coming up to me and, and you know, you recognize a lot of them, people like Dr. Claire Craig, who's been on my podcast and obviously Toby Young was there and yep. Andrew Dolan, people like that. And Sharon Davis and people. But then there were also just people you said, oh, how, what do you do? And they're just like, oh, I was fired from the civil service. It's, I was fired from this. It's like a kind of weird <laughs> heaven of like all the people that have been, or purgatory, I don't know, of all yeah. the people that have been fired or hell. I'm not sure which, which it was. But um, <laughs> it was everyone that's just been fired from some job and, and had to go to a free speech union or something like that. And that's why the free speech union exists. And so, yeah, this is so prevalent now. Quick word on the free speech union. Some people on the kind of online right or whatever you want to call it are very harsh about Toby and the, and the free speech union. And it's, we look, we, it's fun to have a go at Toby. He can be a total normie lib. It's fun to have a go at him, but they're far too harsh because what I keep hearing this, but actually if you, if you knew behind the scenes, the free speech union have represented and offered to represent all kinds of people who are often like mates of the people dissing them and they don't realize they'll offer to defend pretty much anyone. So they do incredible work in this area. Even if you think Toby's not that based, the free speech union are actually totally based, but um, quick shout out for them. But yeah, I think it's going to get more and more prevalent. You're going to need organizations like the free speech union. They keep setting them up in like Scotland and Canada. And we, they're going to need, need to have them all around the world. And on the labor, the other thing that came to my mind when you were speaking is on the labor, it's just going to be presumably so much worse. It's already essentially illegal to be right wing or conservative. But on the labor, it could become more literally illegal. You know, people say, will they get rid of GB news? What other ways will they crack down on free speech? I've certainly not heard them talking about how they're not going to do that. You know, it, it, the only question with labor is how bad is it going to be? Is it going to be a kind of censorship based tyranny, but they also get some stuff done because the civil service actually listened to them? Or is it just yeah. going to be full on tyranny and collapse? <laughs> that's, well, that's how I'm looking at it. Yeah. There is some concerns. <clears throat> I mean, I'm part of the zero seats for the Conservative Party. Just to right. you know, I you know, I think it's it's just the biggest betrayal. Fourteen years, and you know the mess that we're in now. So I'm I'm kind of in the zero seats camp. Um, <clears throat> I've lost a lot of trust. I'm quite cynical actually, Nick, from uh, the past couple of years from how we've been treated. Anyway, um, I just feel like you know I've been lied to, not just me, but a lot of people it's, it's not about me obviously um but uh you know there is this concern though with with labor even though it's two cheeks of the same ass uh when it comes to labor and, and tory that i don't know man it's it seems like it's just going to be like a fast conveyor belt in terms of legislation in terms of cracking down on mean tweets and uh, and and what have you so it is a little bit concerning in in that sort of area when it comes to labor getting in although i have seen that there have been people that do lobby the government that do have a voice when it comes to the other side of politics like for example um uh, aaron bastani at navara media uh, i think they have quite some power in terms of talking to labor and maybe lobbying i think so 
Um, and I know Aaron's really quite keen to push on with um, PR, proportional representation, so that maybe we can have more of a you know a wider net of, of different parties to come in. So yeah, I'm I'm quite. Hopefully, we'll see something like that. You know, best case scenario for, for me, even though I'm not that side of politics, is probably a hung parliament with Labour, Lib Dems, and then they push through PR, and then all of a sudden you get grassroots um, uh, political parties coming through. But um, I don't know. Do you, do you have an opinion on uh, on the well the upcoming election? I guess, and uh, and and your thoughts around that. Well, firstly, on PR, it seems to me unlikely they'd do it. What do I know? I'm just a comedian. But it seems like if they did PR, why would Labour get in with a crushing majority yeah, and exactly. then introduce ways to get yeah. rid of it? Traditionally, they have wanted PR, but it seems like now it, it seems unlikely. I could be wrong. Um, on zero seats, that's very interesting. I know that people like Nima Parvini, who's been on my podcast, uh, Academic Agent, is very pro zero seats. And he even wrote this article, The Labour 600. And he wants, uh, he wants, he wants such a crushing victory that it actually delegitimizes the entire system, which is fascinating. And he quoted Tony Blair in his book saying that he was worried about having too crushing a victory in 1997 and actually destroying the entire two party system. That's something you don't hear about too much. What if we win by so much? It delegitimizes this whole scam. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's an interesting one, but Nima wants that. I'm not sure what he wants next. I need to talk to him about that. But it seems to me he just wants the he wants this to render the whole system illegitimate. Now the argument against comes from Peter Hitchens, who yes was very much destroy the Tories in 2010. I keep telling you all to destroy them, but you didn't listen to me. Nobody listened, and now it's too late. Is what I keep saying. Yeah. So he told everyone to listen. You know, it must be frustrating. It must be so frustrating if yeah. you're Hitchens, and every day people are tweeting, what do we do, Peter? I told you what to do in 2010. <laughs> you simply didn't listen. You know, he gets annoyed, but you can see why. It must yeah. be so annoying. Yeah. Um, I mean, I always tell people I started the Trigonometry Podcast, and that's annoying enough. But, you know, I had a <laughs> podcast with Francis and... I mean, Constant takes it over and everyone tells me, oh, have you seen this? Podcast? Yeah, yes, I've seen it, but he started it. They use my producer and co-host. Yes, I think yeah. I start. I think I know about the podcast. So now Hitchens is like, you know, it must be so annoying. But um, he said, don't vote for them in 2010, destroy the Tory party. But now he says, it's too late, may as well vote for them. I don't know if you've heard his analogy. He, he made the analogy of the, um, the uh, Aesop's fable about the right. frogs. So the frogs ask for a, a ruler and God sends down, I don't know which God it is, just God in general, sends down a log. And the frog's like, what's this stupid log you've given us? And they're all eventually, they, they're worried about it. Then they jump on it and they're fine. They start right. jumping off the log. They start talking about the log and how pathetic it is. It doesn't do anything. It just sits there. Then the God goes, okay, here you go. And he sends down a, a stork. Sometimes it's a snake or a heron. It starts eating all the frogs. Like, oh, what? Wait, give us the log back. His point being, the toys are completely ineffectual. They're bad, but they're relatively ineffectual because they can't do anything. Wait till you get Labour. They're the actual aggressively bad government that are aggressively going to destroy citizens. And you know what? It sounds, to a zero-seats guy like you, may sound a bit flimsy, but when you think about things like, and I would tend to agree with you, but then when you think about things like euthanasia. Right, yeah. These are key issues where yeah. we've seen in Canada, they're just offering oh, yeah. people... 13,500 killed in 2022. That's over 4% of the deaths that year. A 41-year-old woman with fibromyalgia who, silent, who, who who in private admits to her friends she just wants to, she's just too poor. Yeah. And they kill her because she's poor. They, they, she yeah. cites fibromyalgia. An autistic young man who says he's being bullied, killed. So this is coming to Britain. We now see in Belgium, a guy has just suggested openly, an insurance guy, that People should, old people should just probably die if they want to die and they're kind of not enjoying their life. We should just get rid of them because they're a burden on society. This is what's coming. Make no mistake. Keir Starmer is obsessed with assisted dying. This is going to come to the UK. They'll just be killing people. And if you look at Labour, they also love abortion and perhaps the abortion up to term thing will go through. So think about it. They'll be killing millions of babies on one hand, killing old people on the other hand. It's just a, a lefty death cult yeah. of labor. Sounds ridiculous, but actually all, all, all too plausible. Yeah. Well, I mean, The Guardian did write a spread about Genghis Khan saying that he was great for the environment. I don't know if you read that. <laughs> That's it's, so good. That's one of those big check. Is it parody? 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, it, it was a legitimate Guardian article, and it's Amazing. it's unbelievable. Yeah, that Genghis Khan was great for the environment, despite his mischievousness almost. Yeah, it's like, he was a oh. bit of a, a, a rascal, wasn't he? Um, yeah. yeah, it's very much like uh, it's very much sorry, I was my video. It's very much like Diane Abbott, isn't it? With her unbalanced Mao did more good than harm. Oh, I always gosh, remind people of yes. that. Yes. Oh. Yesterday she was saying she'd never come on GB News. It's like, really, Diane? Are we worse than Mao? Is that right? <laughs> so Mao is good. Killed what? Eighty, a hundred million? Various, you know, you know, figures may vary, but it's in the it's in the tens of millions, or you know, led to their deaths with his policies and so on. Then you go GB News. Oh no, they've got Jacob Rees Mogg on there. <laughs> it's like you don't have to go on his show. Like, chill out. I know. <laughs> it's so weird. I and they've got Michael Botillo on there, who's a, meant to be her old mate from That's this true, week. actually. No, and started by Andrew Neil, who's surely meant to be her old mate. But hey, I know he's not on there anymore. But You made a good point. I, You know, it's a good point, especially Keir Starmer with um, assisted dying and um, um, abortion and just like we were talking about, the con- almost like the, the conveyor belt speeding up in terms of legislation and um, and what they want to push through. The thing is, for me... I have a feeling that, and this is just based on feeling and just with the way Keir Starmer holds himself, I feel as though he is going to be monumentally unpopular, even with a majority. So I think this upcoming election will be a case of, let's just get rid of the Tories, that's it. And I don't think they're doing it because it's Keir Starmer or like there's a brilliant leader on the other side. We know that he's useless, Keir Starmer, and that he's Captain Hindsight uh, was his nickname for a while because he would he would finally make a decision or finally give an opinion on something like, you know, <laughs> or finally turn around and actually say, do you know what, I believe in this when it, you know, he was late to the party. But I, I actually think he's going to be like demonstrably unpopular, which is which I think is a good thing. And that's kind of why I'm sitting in the zero seats camp because I'm, you know, I'm not happy with reform. I'm not happy with the deselection of, of candidates for, for saying some spicy things on Twitter. And I, I did read something quite recently that um, I think uh, Tice went to fire a particular candidate and turns out he was dead. Um, he was going to fire him <laughs> for uh for saying something spicy on the internet and turns out that he, he actually had died. So it's kind of like, wow, wow that's that, serious. That's the next level for people like hope, not hate, isn't it? They're oh just, yeah, uh, exactly. Don't want to say anything libelous here, but yeah, go on. Yeah. So um, you're zero seats. Zero, zero seats. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm very much pro zero seats. I think I, I believe that the two party system, I believe it's two cheeks on the same arse. That's, that's my view. <clears throat> they don't really separate each other. Um, that much in terms of policy they're both very pro net zero they're both they're both almost not taking the illegal immigration and immigration in general seriously um you know they're really keen for sustainable development 2030 all of that stuff and it's just gotten to the point where it's like well not to sound revolutionary or anything like that. I know I used to be an ex-communist when I was 16, 17. I'm 30 now, so obviously I grew out of that. <laughs> and I'm not. Oh, wow, you like Peter Hitchens. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. It's um it was a wild journey. It was Brexit that sorted me out, I think, and uh and Trump. Um but yeah, I don't know. I think the two party system to me it's clear it doesn't work. It does need to be destroyed. The 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 Tory party does need to just I don't know, be reduced to ashes and then rebuild something that's actually going to be conservative, you know? And I think that's what a lot of voters thought, okay, we'll, we'll diverge to reform. But then we see elements of kind of dipping your toe in the establishment, dipping it back out. It, I don't know. It, for me, it just is quite disappointing. Yeah, well, hopefully I'm going to have Ben Habib on my podcast mm. and I'll be able to grill him about some I of like this. Him. I've had Richard... Yeah, he he seems really nice. I've had, I've had Richard on before, so I'm going to hopefully get some answers on right. that because I've been like you. I've been like, I said I'm not voting for reform because of that. The only thing is, I do open. I'm open to they can win back my vote because that's how these things work. If they yeah. really changed, but yes, the idea of capitulating endlessly to to our enemies who hope not hate are now openly gloating. 
on X about we got rid of all these reform candidates. And Richard Tice even said that it's part of our vetting process to let the media vet our candidates. What, you let okay, communists... Good, good uh, luck with that. <laughs> let communists completely vet you, okay. It's madness. So, um, but on the... So, yeah, I'm not sure about reform yet. Yeah, TBC, really. But but it, on your... I mean, yes, I was very against them when they got dropped a load of candidates. I'm going to see. But yeah, the... Um, the other point about Starmer is absolutely right. You know how how unpopular he is, and how bad he'll be. That's the thing. There's only two Labour's I see. One, like I say, the one where it's just total tyranny and chaos. The other one where it's tyranny, but they actually get some things done with the NHS and defence and immigration because maybe the civil service let them. But it may be the case that the civil service are not even at the behest of Starmer anymore. I know people that do love Starmer in this sort of extended blob, in the sort of BBC, Bank of England, think tank kind of world. They all love Starmer. They think he's going to come back, bring us back into the EU. He's the saviour. They all hated Boris. So maybe they'll do what he wants, but maybe not. And maybe it'll just be more chaos. It could fall apart very quickly. I, I am, I sort of veer between thinking it's going to fall apart in a few years and then you have a, an opening for a sort of Farage or someone to now thinking, well, maybe they'll just have such a majority, people weirdly still seem to vote for this stuff. Maybe they just stay in longer. And I now can't see, I did predict that Farage would come in and win and join the Tories. I'm not sure at the moment because he said that he's he doesn't seem keen on coming back. He seems to like his life too much and and, and the money he's getting and going to America and you know doing that kind of thing rather than wanting to come back, have a really hard time, win no seats. Genuinely doesn't seem up for it. He wants to do some sort of American trade job with Trump, even though he says he won't get that job. But he, so I'm not sure now where it goes. Even if Labour are awful, what happens? To be honest, you said you were cynical. Probably not even cynical enough. I mean, I just see total decline into third world country, which is not yeah. some racial comment. I, I mean, in terms of you know total collapse. I just see Labour not being able to do anything. Then I was speaking to David Starkey about this, so not unnamed, but I was chatting to Starkey and I was grilling him about this. And he, I said, well, what if, maybe we get our sort of Millet though, um, David, you know, he's saying like, he'll say, he'll, you know, it'll become like Argentina. And I said, maybe we get our Millet. He goes, because we have to remember, he said it took de- eight decades or something to get, I can't remember the exact figure he said, but he said it took decades to get your Millet. So actually it could be a long way off. You know, it could just be more and more collapse. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's quite a concerning time. What do you think about? Because I I have a lot of um, people who follow my content and say things like, "I'm not voting. I'm not doing it. I'm not getting involved anymore. I'm done. Um, there is no point to voting." A lot of people, you know, are in that camp, and I actually sympathise with that a lot. And I was like that for yeah, last couple of years. I was. But as it gets closer, my view is, what else are you going to do? You have to get involved in some way if you want to make change. If you have a large platform, you know you have that power to lobby and pass information along to people and break it down for people and to almost lobby the government or hold people account if you're an independent journalist, even if you're part of a, a media organization. But if you're the average Joe who does who isn't part of that world and just you know comments on it and has an opinion, I the only way really to get involved is to talk about it first, obviously. But voting on a local level, definitely. Getting involved, definitely. But also to to say, to abandon that all and just say, not gonna do anything, there's no point. I don't know, man. I'm I'm I I have to disagree with that. I don't know what your view is. I I'm, I presume it's it's yes, get up, go out and vote. Um but yeah, what is your view? M- my view like so many of my views expressed today is ambivalent. It's, I can understand not voting now because I would have said vote in the past, but I can understand it for, for one reason, really, that it's arguably, it arguably sends a message. I used to think it doesn't send a message. They'll just, they'll just get on with it anyway. But if enough people didn't do it, you would lose the tacit consent of the people. So if you listen to people like Nima, when he's an academic agent, when he talks about elite theory, elite theory is quite a wake up call because people like Mosca and Pareto and so on and Schmidt, all these people throughout history who looked at how power works and they said, okay, they said a few things. They said that the organized minority always beats a disorganized majority. So you get this elite and then they're never overthrown by the people. So the will of the people is a myth. 
The power of the people is a myth. They never overthrow them. If you actually look at it, what happens is a, a counter elite comes in and replaces them, and then they just rule as well. And the and and voting is a bit of a fraud because the candidates are pre-selected. Yep. We've seen lately how the Tories are kind of rigging their selection system to keep anyone conservative out and stack it with One Nation people. So the whole thing's kind of rigged. All you can hope for in that case is a new elite that happens to align more with your interests. So we were discussing, I was discussing with him, perhaps an Elon Musk, Tucker Carlson, Trump kind of elite comes in in the US or something like that. So it's not perfect because it's got a more libertarian, but it's more along the lines of what we'd like. So so that's one answer. Another way, though, is that I've heard that spoiled ballots are registered. So yeah. I'd say a spoiled ballot already is more powerful than a non-vote which could yeah. mean anything. It's an it's yeah. expression of like, I disagree with the system. Yeah. Or you could also go in and what I'm planning to do, just look at, find the most right wing party and just take that. <laughs> but, um, but I don't know, because like I say, I've got my problems with reform. Where I am, Labour will win an absolutely crushing majority. They won by 30,000 nearly in 2019 when the Tories were actually fairly popular. They won a crushing majority. So they will win. They'll get the Lib Dem votes probably as well. They'll probably win by 40,000. So it's pointless in my area anyway, on the first past the post. So what I do therefore is vote with conscience. So last time I voted Christian People's Alliance because I looked at their policies and I was like, I agree with all this. It was like, uh, make big corporations pay tax, crack down on crime in London, observe democracy by getting Brexit done properly and protect the unborn. I was like, who could disagree with any yeah. of that? So yeah. um, so I was like, boom, I'll vote for this lot. And they got like 200 something votes to the Labour candidates, 30,000. So it's, you know... It's pointless, but it, I suppose it registers something. So this time I think I would either register some sort of party on the right to register, I hate the Tories, or a spoiled ballot if I can't even vote for the people on the right. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, I think we have a massive responsibility as well because we know that Keir Starmer's going to get in. We know that he's going to speed up that conveyor belt, um, figuratively speaking. I think we have a massive duty now in the media, whether it be mainstream, alternative. Sorry, there might be an actual conveyor belt if Starmer gets in. <laughs> think about euthanasia. Yeah. Could end up just an actual conveyor belt. You're Loads too of old, psychopods. 60 like, years old, get on the belt. Just, yeah. <laughs> just a thought. Like Star just, Trek, that machine where everyone just walks in and it just disintegrates everyone. Like you yeah. probably create something like that. Yeah. But um, that's a joke, obviously. Yeah, that's a joke. Um, that's me in my comedic capacity. Now we'll switch back to commentary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll like let a you light know. switch. Um, yeah, I think I think there's a massive responsibility now for the mainstream media, the alternative. I say mainstream. I would say people like GB News, who are sort of, like I said, more sort of uh, mainstream and alternative at the same time. Um, although Ofcom, a bit of a bit of an annoying subject, which we we can get into. I think there is a massive responsibility now to help the ordinary people um, that aren't in this world to lobby the government, to, to get people together, to prepare for anything that they, they disagree with and to utilise their democratic right to lobby. You know, I look at petitions, I look at things like that. We saw loads of them for the past couple of years from um, from now to 2020 and obviously petitions have been going around you know uh, for a long long time but people also think just with voting petitions there's no point they just look at it throw it out or if they debate there's only like one person i mean we've seen andrew bridgen talking about e excess deaths and hardly any mps just turn up and people are sitting there going come on we need a conversation um and there's actually more people outside of the chamber cheering him on to <laughs> then there are MPs actually in there discussing it, debating it and coming to a conclusion. So I think going back to my original point, I think there's a massive responsibility to lobby the government in this next election. I think there's a massive responsibility for people to once again, like in the 2020s, uh, 2021 with lockdowns, um, with the jabs, all sorts of things, to actually come together again and say, we don't agree with this. Uh, we need to put pop, uh, like party politics down. We need to put politics aside and say, this is wrong. We actually need to really um, steamroll some, uh, some lobbying in. I mean, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I don't know too much about how lobbying works. Obviously, 
one way is to just uh, to pressure the government, which is sort of what Farage's role has been for so long, to just pressure the government from outside. And and, and that's one argument that the only way is you can act, is to actually change the Tories. Danny Kruger was heard in these leaked messages. In leaked, uh, he was speaking actually, and it was leaked, even though it was fine. It didn't say anything bad. He was just saying he saw reform as a destructive force, and that the the the, the only way is to stay with the Tory party and try and get them to actually do what you want. Or oh, that seems to most people impossible now. And it seems like they're dead, but um, or possibly dead. That's, that's one angle. You, you can lobby people to do what you want. Petitions. I see what you mean. I think that sort of general sense of apathy yeah. really kicked in for my generation with the Iraq war. When yes. there were these massive demonstrations, uh, you know, to not go to war. And the biggest turnout you've ever seen in London, huge, huge numbers dwarfing these protests we have now about with Palestine and so on and the the, the press underreported it or actually some of the press actually covered it fairly back in the day you didn't have quite the level of fake news you have now but the police claimed there weren't as many people and I remember Jeremy Paxman snobbily going on are you, are you saying the police would lie about it like, you know it's like okay whatever yeah, Jeremy come so on, mate. <laughs> you like the idea so, so they toned down the number they played it down and Blair just did what he wanted anyway and it was kind of an example of um of how things work with elites and how people like Blair, they just didn't listen at all. Though it has been a mark against him. It has damaged his perception and his career, you know, that war. But it's, it's funny that people were so against the war. I never believed the weapons of mass destruction. Many of us didn't. They didn't do anything at all. So I see why people would say, you know, what will a petition do? It gets to a certain level. They have to debate it, don't they? What What is the number? There's a certain number where they have to talk about it. 100,000, I believe. I yeah. But you're right, Bridgen's a good, good example, isn't he? And that sort of image of him at the empty chamber and more people outside supporting him is a kind of stark image of how out of touch the elites are. I was just reading, uh, rereading Michelle Welbeck's submission as a great novel, and I was talking about it on my substack, nickdixon.net, and there was a great bit in it. He said, the, this is the novel where Islam takes over, and it's a sort of uh, imagined version of how that would work in France. And he, he writes at one point, the idea that political history could play any part in my own life was still disconcerting and slightly repellent. All the same, I realized I'd known for years that the widening gap, now a chasm between the people and those who claim to speak for them, the politicians and journalists, would necessarily lead to a situation that was chaotic, violent and unpredictable. For a long time, France, like all the other countries in Western Europe, had been drifting towards civil war. That much was obvious. I read that and thought, yeah, I mean, you wrote that in 2015. That is kind of... Where I'm not saying civil war, but I'm saying the gap between people and the politicians is now so great that you are in danger. And like you say, there seems to be no way to affect anything. Voting doesn't work because of first past the post or because the parties are not representing you in their policies anyway. Petitions don't seem to work. Maybe lobbying works a bit. We don't know. Or maybe some of us know. But it's like, what can you do? So when a gap is wide enough, when the elites have lost the tacit consent of the people, as in elite theory what does happen yeah. and that's sort of i see that, that i see that that's going that way with this labor government an increasingly oppressive government bringing about the hate crime law we talked about before pointless laws more tyranny more crime more immigration more economic problems health service still knackered defense still a joke you know i you know you could just imagine the whole thing just the people just, what's, what what does happen eventually i don't yeah. know what do people do there's a huge amount of apathy and but what do people do eventually at that point I don't know what happens. Yeah. And it's that question, isn't it? What do you do when the head of state and your government are preaching from the same choir yet, or singing from the same hymn sheet or whatever the phrase is, so I butchered that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, when when both the government and the head of state are really pushing for like things like net zero, really pushing things for, for mass immigration, all of these key issues that the majority of the public are really concerned about what do you do when when you feel like your vote doesn't count you you're not heard in petitions you're not heard in in just the standard emailing your mp because your mp would rather i don't know talk about talk about climate change um and you know how we're all going to engulf in a ball of fire in 5 years like ex extinction rebellion things and just up oil so, you know, I understand the frustration. I think the only solution to me is to create communities, is to once again get back into the community. It's so easy now to create groups, whether it be on Facebook, whether it be through social media, 
um, you know, within your community who think the same as you, not saying echo chamber, I'm saying gather people who, who say, I'm really unhappy with this. Let's get together and let's form a plan. And the more people, it just grows. And it, because of social media, that really helps. Um, so that goes back to my point of we have an incredible responsibility now, um, people with platforms, people um, who are in media, alternative or mainstream. If you don't like something, instead of just talking about it, that we've got to figure out a way to help the ordinary people who aren't in the, the in this circle, this weird circle, um, to really get out there and try and and push for tra- for change. You know. Mm. Yeah. On your first point about net zero, that's one of the things that could possibly be be put away. Again, to use Nima's formulation of uh, putting the woke away, they could the, the elite could suddenly put some of these things away because. We've seen that Labour have already, I believe, shelved their 28 billion green plan. That was shelved pretty quick before they even got in. Yeah. And net zero, even Rishi has been pretty sensible on toning that down. Labour, they'll have pressure from the left, but they could tone that down a lot. And this is this is the thing. There's a version of Starmer where he gets in and he's ruthless. He's listening to Blair. He's got his little leadership manual Blair's written for him. He's chatting to Blair every day. And Blair will say something like, Put away net zero, focus instead on financial services that we can export. There's a piece yesterday saying we're the second biggest exporter in the world or something. Or I, I, I was like, really? But it was, it was a financial services and professional services and things, legal service and so on. So you go, okay, we're strong in financial services. We can help the developing world in that way, which Blair has said. But this stuff about net zero, we're already very low emissions. China's doing what it wants. Let's tone that down. You could see that happening. Yeah. And that would be very smart if they did that. Um, because it once people once it hits people's wallets and number two the geopolitical situation being so unstable and we've got Russia we've got China we've got we've got Israel Palestine we've got all these things going on it may well become untenable to keep banging on about net zero it may be much more about get military spending up and get a more you know spend on on nuclear in terms of energy and spend on defense and things like this it, it could get a lot more brutal like that and net zero is really a luxury idea. Um, that's on that. On the other point about community, that's the big one. I don't have the answers, but this is what I see people trying to do now. There was the ARC. I don't know if you went to ARC. No, but... I didn't actually. Okay. No. I went to, uh, I, actually, I got a pass in the end, but I only managed to get to one day. Um, and I was interviewing people and stuff, but I, I went and had a little look at it. It was mainly about the people meeting up. The actual events were sort of a little bit corny and at, at times were thought to be a bit hokey. And a lot of them were just Jordan Peterson interrupting people for long periods of time. <laughs> Great question. I'm now going to speak for 37 minutes about God. Um, so stuff like that. But the what everyone said was, and Ed Dutton said this to me, it's like the meeting of people. I met Ed there. I met Curtis Yarvin and all kinds of people. Coleman Hughes and just all, all sorts of people were there. And it was much more about that. And everyone had a sort of similar, they did, 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 it's not they had the same beliefs, but they were all alienated by the current yeah. setup. So we know there's lots of people like that. We know there's loads of seaters. And, yes. it, and the question is, how do you, and there's you and there's me and there's all these people. And the question is, how do you do it? And one thing I've been thinking about is we need to be not react, just reacting. I do think I'm, I'm guilty of that because I'm on GB and we're talking about woke every day. I'm on the weekly skeptic and we're mocking it woke and stuff, which is fine. It's kind of what comedians do and satire and stuff. But we also need to be thinking proactively, like, what are we building yeah. And that's the part that I think is hard. You know, I try and talk about books on my Substack. I talk about art and things and cool. art more broadly, not necessarily visual art, but like things that people aren't thinking would be talking about. And there are roots of this in the right. You know, some of it's more extreme right, but it's like there are people like Ezra Pound and there are sort of, there is a history, this idea that the right are all sort of Philistines, you know, just like shouting in a sort of tabloid manner in a sort of starchy blue suit. And I've worn <laughs> suits like that. But the point is, that that is the image of people like, some people think that's what gb news is in reality you've got people like andrew Doyle, extremely smart yeah. with a phd in medieval poetry or something like that and simon evans one of the smartest guys i've met and i try and make sure we have a certain level of brain power and a certain level and and you know i, I was i was replying to matthew stadlin once on x he was attacking me and i and i quoted leonard cohen and things i was thinking they're not expecting us to do that you see yeah they're expecting us to be thugs and, and idiots and um 
an evil. And if we, if you actually say, no, no, these are disaffected artistic type of people. You know, I was an artistic type of person. I've read a load of postmodern literature and listened to alternative country music. Cool. And, you know, I love Morrissey. Like, so here yeah. I am on the, on the right, you know, but it's not, it's not the conventional right. It's, it's, or what, or, or, or the cliche of the right. When you delve into it, you find out the right is artistic and creative and, and dissident and always yes. has been. And, you know, but the, the image is that where the thick ones are. The, the, and the idea of Peterson and people like this say that if you're high in, high in openness, that you're therefore a liberal. But Ed Dutton was, uh, was ridiculing that and saying, actually, you're not ridiculing, but he was sort of rubbishing that and saying, uh, that actually all, that all, all openness shows is, is it, like a flawed measure of all it actually shows is if you're a liberal. So it doesn't really tell us anything. Anyway, I'm rambling a bit there, but the, the idea is that somehow you're, you're creative, therefore you're on the left. And I'm just saying, that's actually not true. You know, it's much more complicated than that. It said I lost my connection during the peak of my rant there. So I, yeah. I didn't hit, I didn't hit Peterson Heights. That's why I'm not, <laughs> I suddenly got, I suddenly got thrown off by that. But my, the point I was trying to get to was that we hear things like, okay, liberals are high in openness. It's a left wing thing to be creative and all this kind yeah. of, it's all bollocks, all myths, all myths. Yeah. So we need to on the right be, or whatever we are, conservatives, whatever we're called, we need to be proactive. We need to be artistic. We need to be smart and we need to build things. Easier said than done though. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to do it, but I'm not sure yet. No, I think that's great. It's a fantastic answer. I, um, I've got a final question for you and it was, okay. it's in relation to GB news and Ofcom. I know you like to, you enjoy slagging them off a lot, which I do too. Uh, just, I'm not, you know, part of the sphere. Um, are you concerned that Ofcom is going to ramp up. Are you concerned that if that that zero seats does happen to the Tories, um, not like it would make a difference with them not having zero seats, but um, are you concerned that Ofcom are just going to go full guns blazing, not just at GB News, but to uh, to other alternative media on uh, on the internet? Because we know that the online safety bills come through. Um, and that transitions their power, not just in broadcasting, but now onto the internet. Uh, so the idea of policing YouTube accounts is just insane, but um, it's not far off. Uh, what's your thoughts um, before uh, before we wrap up? Yeah, I'm very concerned, obviously, about that. GB being my main source of income, uh, which um, someone was handily pointing out to me the other day was is not the smartest thing. This was a guy who's now at Byline Times, I believe, used to be at Five Live, I think, just talking about sports. But now he gets paid to be far left and oh. said something about the morality of GB News. And I was thinking, he implied it was immoral. I'm thinking, well, you're just lefty for pay now. So who's more, at very least, we're the same, at very worst. Actually, mm. I'm just speaking my mind. But when he was sort of saying, you know, be careful. Maybe it was a threat, I don't know. But it was it, it, the point is, of course, my job is potentially in jeopardy if Starmer comes in and cracks down on GB News, you know, through Ofcom. It won't be like Starmer doing it directly. It'll be little nudges to Ofcom and so on. Yeah. That seems very possible. People have said that to me. Or they just censor it and make it increasingly difficult for GB, which we've already seen these constant strikes and these investigations all the time. Although I've now seen that maybe David Lammy is being investigated at LBC. I heard, I don't know if that's true, something like that. I heard a story about it. I didn't follow up on that. But you, one imagines it's not going to be applied evenly, let's say. So, you know, and with the online safety bill, like you say, incredibly worrying. The idea of these people just taking over the entire internet, I mean, it could get far less free. I see, I see that happening on the Labour. The EU are very much like this. They're always trying to shut down Elon Musk. You know, yeah. maybe we have a situation where we can't access X properly in the EU. You know, like in Canada, they get these messages like, this is not oh, available yeah. in your country. We could have like, we can't access X properly. They can in America because of the First Amendment, but we can't in in. Or, or we can in Britain, but the EU can't, or we follow the EU and we can't either. I see all these kind of things happening. So I think, yeah, it's going to get more and more oppressive. It's already essentially illegal to be conservative. I see it getting more and more oppressive. There's every indication that's the way it's going to go on the storm. Whatever else happens, I'd say that, that one's almost certain. So I don't know where that goes because it's already like that, isn't it, where YouTube can just ban you, yep. Ofcom can fine you. It's already like that, and I see it getting a lot worse. And the thing to remember with Ofcom, I always say, is the Overton window is so far left. But I think Toby was saying to me tonight, it's not just that it's far left. It's it's the left can go out as far as they want in the Overton window, but it only goes a tiny bit right. It's very narrow the other way. 
So it starts over to the left anyway. And then there's all this extra room. It's very long in one direction and then like a tiny bit of room. So a good example is we have people like Michael Walker on GB News. Yep. I've said this before, Bobby, who's a Navara Media. So he's far left. They don't have Carl Benjamin on GB News. I find that yeah. strange because especially as the one of the people funding it allegedly reposted one of Carl's posts. So it's like Carl can't come on. He's pretty moderate. You know, he said a couple of things in the past and got in trouble, but he's pretty moderate. Yet sort of actual communists can come yeah. on. You can never have the equivalent of that on the right. So you, you, you can't even have something much more moderate on the right. Why is that? Why can Ash Sharka come on mainstream TV and say she's literally a communist? Yeah. So what we have is, and I'm sure your listeners already know this, but what we have is a very strictly policed far left Overton window. And that's going to be policed now online. And Starm is going to push that more and more. And yeah, I just see more of that coming, to be honest with you. Well, <laughs> I hope that you're wrong. <laughs> I hope that it's all going to, you know, be daisies and roses, but I, I don't actually see that happening personally. Uh, but, you know, I'm not I'm not a P. Hitchens, let's abandon ship and just move country. I, I can't, for me, that's just, that's too much. Like for me, I, I can't, I, I, I have almost like a duty. You have this duty to want to stay and you have this duty to want to actually make positive change, even as terrible as it may be. Um, I couldn't just, I don't think, I, I mean, this could probably be clipped later on. I'll end up moving to America next year or something, but uh, I don't feel like it's right for me to just pack everything up and just leave and just go somewhere else. Um, I understand why people do that, completely understand why people do that, but there's something in me that's saying, no, you need to, it's like, Jordan Peterson's, you know, clean your room, like before you go, like before you start reorganizing the world, you know? Yeah. I mean, I suppose the only thing that could stop a lot of this happening is just incompetence or labor fighting too many other battles to do all this stuff. And as for the thing about leaving, I'm very much like you. I'm much more on the Churchill sort of choking in, in, in your own blood, uh, you know, defending England sort of thing. But I suppose there is a, you could imagine circumstances where you just, if you can't work for some reason, they make it just impossible where you'd have to leave. I was thinking a circumstance the other day where I'd have to leave. I can't remember what it was. I need to remember because I, I was basically thought I never would leave. Then I thought of a circumstance the other day. I was like, okay, if that happened, I guess I'd have to, but I can't remember what it was. But maybe it's just something to do with them making this sort of thing completely impossible that we do. Yeah. Maybe. Um, but yeah, I'm one of those people like you. I, I don't think I'd leave. So I suppose you have to hope for the other Hitchens thing. You hope, hope for the King Log kind of incompetence that just stops them tyrannizing you because they're too incompetent to actually do that. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah, but let's hopefully if we all stay, I mean, I know some people have left already. People, I know people have gone to Bulgaria and things like that. Yeah. You know, and, and people like Ed Dutton thinks it's over for this country. We're going to have a neo Byzantium somewhere else. <laughs> he suggested Finland as a possibility, <laughs> but he said that it gets minus 30 degrees there and your, yeah. your, your, your penis freezes. So I'm like, <laughs> hang on, Ed. I'm not sure about this neo cock freezing byzantium I'm yeah like, no thanks <laughs> stick with good old england but, yeah i know we yeah. can deal with the cold but not that cold <laughs> <laughs> that's ridiculous isn't it yeah. so i'm like yeah but it depends I don't, do we it depends we're finished here doesn't it i don't mm. know man i'm like you i think we're finished but i can't leave my home so there we go yeah. maybe i retreat to the shires you know and just retreat to the country and see how long you can last i don't know that's it Nick Dixon, thank you so much for your time. Uh, really appreciate you taking your time out to, to come and have a chat. Uh, where can we find you? Where is the best place to see your work? Um, yeah, take it away, man. Well, thanks, Lewis. I'm worried that ending was too bleak and that the whole thing was quite bleak, <laughs> but I chucked some jokes in. Great. So you can find me. Well, it, well, if you like Toby Young, you can listen to me on The Weekly Skeptic, which is kind of a funny weekly podcast. But not everyone, if you don't like Toby, obviously not. Or if you don't like me, then you're screwed really for all this bit. But um, <laughs> you can also find me on The Current Thing, which is my other podcast where I interview people. And that's really doing well as, as well now. So check out The Current Thing. NickDixon.net for my Substack, where I put up my articles, which are very good. And also I'm going to be putting extra content for my podcast soon. It's only a five a month, 50 quid a year. It's pretty reasonable, NickDixon.net. And you, well, if you really like me, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash Nick Dixon. That's, I guess, more for my hardcore fans. So maybe start with uh, the Current Thing podcast or nickdixon.net. Is that enough plugs? Yeah, <laughs> that's great, man. We'll leave that all in. <laughs> awesome. Right. Thank you so much, Nick. You take care. Thanks, mate. <laughs>